Hi guys and welcome to the second episode of this special series that is on my channel where I take a look at the careers and the lives of the actors that have all played the Doctor uh, over the years uh, through the use of this book, The Doctor's Who's Who. Uh, apologies it's been such a gap between the first and the second episode. There uh, have been another, uh, a number of things sort of going on out of, out of my control really. Um, but I had a great great response to the, to the first video. Um, much more than, than what I thought I was going to get to be honest um, and the best thing about it was people that weren't necessarily Doctor Who fans um, that that really enjoyed it and found it very interesting or even just those that were Doctor Who fans but hadn't really known that much um, sort of about about William Hartnell obviously being, being the, uh, the first Doctor you know some of the younger generation maybe have not looked that far back um, to, uh, to the earlier earlier uh, regenerations of, uh, of the Doctor so, uh, so really, really glad that so many of you enjoyed it, um, and the offer is still there for um, for the quiz that I mentioned in that first episode. Uh, if enough people um, want um, uh, a quiz to to well, I say a quiz, um, a competition. That's the right word uh, to win some copies of uh, of this book. Uh, thanks to John Blake's publishing, who who published uh, published this book. Um, they said, you know, if, if enough people want to do it, then we'll send uh, send you a number of free copies, and um, I can give them out as prizes. So, if uh, if enough people are interested later on in the series, then I will uh, set some questions um, in the different episodes, and uh, some of you lucky winners may uh, may win a copy of this book. So, uh, yeah, like I say, let me know if uh, if you'd be interested in that in the comments below. But without further ado. Let's uh, get on with this episode and move on to the second Doctor, which of course was played by Patrick Troughton. Ah, thank you very much. That's very civil of you. Oh my you word. You claim to be able to done rather well so far, didn't you? <laughs> More by luck than by judgment, if you ask me. Adjust their minds to suit our purpose. Sausages! Man will just become like a string of sausages all the same. Man will simply vanish. <laughs> That'll do. Now then, Jamie, all you've got to do is to add one of these little number nine pills to each bottle just before you throw it like that. But whatever you do, and this is important, you must throw it before ten seconds have elapsed. Six, Otherwise, you are seven, liable to blow... What? Eight! Eight! Ah! <laughs> <laughs> oh, it works! <laughs> it have us on the kingdom come! No, 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 Jamie, that was just a small quantity. But with ten times that amount, you should have quite a handy little bob. Doctor, come on, Willie. The whole place is going to blow up. Oh, it's quite all right, Jamie. The planet is quite safe. There's just going to be a localized volcanic eruption. It'll only affect the island. Maybe so, but we happen to be on the island. <laughs> oh, my word! <laughs> Patrick George Troughton was born in Mill Hill, London, on 25th of March, 1920. At the age of 16, he went to the Embassy School of Acting at Swiss Cottage, London, which was run by Eileen Thorndike, sister of Dame Sybil Thorndike. He earned a scholarship there and progressed to the Leighton Rollins Studio for Actors at the John Drew Memorial Theatre in Long Island, USA. He was in America when the Second World War broke out. He returned to England on a Belgian ship, but it hit an enemy mine and sank just off Portland Bill in sight of England. Troughton escaped by lifeboat and always considered himself lucky to have done so. He joined the Tunbridge Repertory Company on his return to England in 1939 and acted there for a year. 
In June 1940, he joined the Royal Navy, not deterred by his close escape from an ocean-going death the previous year. His first duty was protecting the coast from enemy submarines in a Royal Navy destroyer. He was then transferred to motor torpedo boats based at Great Yarmouth, where he was given his own command after the Allied invasion of Normandy. He left the Royal Navy in March 1945, but always retained a fondness for the sea. Troughton then returned to Acton and joined the Amersham Repertory Company. From there he was asked to join the famous Bristol Old Vic Company, and he appeared in Hamlet in 1947 and King Lear in 1948. He then spent two years with the Pilgrim Players performing T.S. Eliot's plays at the Mercury Theatre in Nottingham. In the early 1980s, Troughton said of his career, I like to play all kinds of people in all kinds of plays. I've got a special liking for fantasy and rip roaring ad adventures with plenty of actions such as Robin Hood and Kidnapped. Troughton always considered himself a character actor, and he cut his teeth on roles in classic boy's own type adventures. He was a character actor personified, which was why he was always very reluctant to give interviews, as he explained in a rare radio interview towards the end of his career. It's wrong for a character actor to promote their own character too much. The audience gets to know you too much, which makes your job harder. Troughton's career was long and distinguished. His first role was in Escape, in which William Hartnell also appeared, in 1948, and in 1950 he was in Disney's Treasure Island alongside Robert Newton's famous Long John Silver, a larger-than-life character actor who had been in the Royal Navy with future Doctor Who, John Pertwee. Troughton's first TV appearance was in 1948. It was the early days of TV, he remembered later. About 300,000 TV viewers in London only. I was never relaxed in live TV. He may not have been, but he played many live roles for about 15 years before pre-recording came in. Unfortunately, many of Troughton's early TV performances, along with those by William Hartnell and to a certain degree John Pertwee, no longer exist, which makes analysis of the actor's work difficult. But many older people remember Troughton as Robin Hood. The six-part show was written by Max Kester and was recorded live at the Gormont British Studios in Lime Grove, London, between 17th of March and 21st of April in 1953. Nowadays, Troughton's grandson Sam appears in the latest BBC interpretation of Robin Hood alongside Jonas Armstrong and Keith Allen. Some of Troughton's other early roles included Guy Fawkes in Gunpowder Guy alongside future Doctor Who producer Barry Letts in 1950 and The Scarlet Pimpernel in 1956. These parts were very minor compared to his film work, which in 1955 included a part of James Tyrrell in Laurence Olivier's iconic Richard III. Although his wasn't a major part in the film, it was memorable. Being summoned by King Richard and told to murder the princes in the tower in a very tight two-shot before providing a very strong voiceover during the murder scene itself. Troughton was clearly up to the job, with so much experience behind him in such, in such a short space of time. In fact, he truly had an additional sinister edge to the film by doing the King's dirty work against his own free will. This wasn't the first time Troughton had played alongside Olivier, having appeared in Hamlet in 1948, which followed his own TV version the previous year. In 1962-63, Troughton played Daniel Quilp in the BBC's epic interpretation of Dickens' The Old Curiosity Shop, something he mentioned as a career highlight in 1983. I did a lot of Dickens. The dwarf Quilp in The Old Curiosity Shop was a big success and a part I look back on with great love and excitement. Diversity was the watchword of Troughton's career, and next he played the blind man Phineas in the film classic Jason and the Argonauts. Several, several years later, in 1966, Troughton was making a film in Ireland called The Viking Queen, when he was asked if he would like to become the second Doctor. At first he didn't want to do it, feeling that it wasn't the right type of part for him. I was astonished that they asked me, he said later. He had watched the show with his children and really enjoyed Hartnell's Doctor, but was unsure if it could continue when Hartnell left. I thought it would last about six weeks after Billy Hartnell had finished, he said in 1983. The whole concept of the Doctor going on was quite a new idea, and one was jumping in at the deep end. The BBC were persistent and finally convinced Troughton, who felt he should black up for his part, simply because as soon as he left the role, he knew that everybody would know him as the Doctor and therefore he would be typecast. It was Sidney Newman who brought Troughton back down to earth and shaped his interpretation of the Doctor, with a throwaway comment, Do what you like with him, play him like Charlie Chaplin if you want to. It's difficult to say if the Chaplin idea was finally Troughton's or Newman's. It appears that Troughton went off the idea and Newman asked, Whatever happened to the Cosmic Hobo? 
A compromise was eventually achieved, with Troughton playing the part very clownishly to begin with, but mellowing as time went on. He reminisced on TV magazine show Nationwide in 1983. First they put a wig on me, and I looked like Harpo Marx. Then they dressed my hair like a beetle. So the zany Chaplin image was toned down from very early on. Troughton needn't have worried about being accepted as a doctor. He was fondly regarded from the off, as highlighted in the Doctor Who annual in 1967. Our new Doctor is more, the, is more with it, he is more switched on, more in tune with the 20th century. There are of course still traces of his whole personality and, characteristically, he still wears the same clothes, which are a trifle baggy on his new figure. So the cosmic hobo was thoroughly accepted. The cast accepted him as well, as Doctor Who companion Anneke Wells, companion Polly, remembers. We played our little joke on Patrick the first day he started. Michael Craze and I ordered some special t-shirts and we greeted our new doctor with the words Come back Bill Hartnell blazoned across our chests. It was a ghastly joke I suppose but dear Patrick took it very well. Troughton remembered his three years as the doctor with fondness. Of all my years as an actor I think these were the happiest three years. I particularly enjoyed acting with Fraser Hines who played Jamie. We never once had a cross word all the time we worked together. Fraser Hines confirms this. For three years Pat and I had an absolute ball together. I think there's always room for fun when you're working, except maybe if it's Chekhov or Shakespeare, and I've always been a practical joker. Trousen got on well with all the regular cast and production crew, as he recounts. Innis Lloyd, the producer when I started, and Peter Bryant were great to work for. I had a lot of fun. Trousen enjoyed the fantasy of the show. He thought it was great that the Doctor could change his appearance, as he explained at the time of the three Doctors. We were all different aspects of the same character. Of course it's bound to be a bit of a mystery to us, but in the Doctor's space time machine the so-called past just doesn't exist. Like Hartnell before him, Troughton said that it was difficult to stop being the Doctor when the cameras were off. But, unlike Hartnell, Troughton's Doctor was not a crotchety old man, but a cosmic hobo, as he explained. When you're playing a part for a long time you certainly take on some of the mental attitudes of the fellow you're playing. Luckily the Doctor was a very jolly fellow, and I just bubbled along. He would also say that having young children at the time, three under ten years old, allowed him to keep in touch with the part of the Doctor, as children loved the character so much. So again, like William Hartnell, there was that Pied Piper aspect to Troughton's Doctor, and not just in the pipe recorder he played, but in regard to the children who followed him. He mentioned the younger views in 1983. It also gave me great pleasure coming into contact with children, for if I had not been an actor, I would quite like to have been a teacher. Children keep one young. In fact, Troughton followed up by stating that the continuing success of the show was due to new children being born. Troughton regretted leaving the show. Very much, but you can't do something forever as a character actor. Three years was a long time for Troughton to be involved in one particular project, as he confessed. If I stayed it, stay with it too long, I would get stuck. After Doctor Who, like before, he took on many memorable roles, and to him, Doctor Who was just one in a long line. In 1983, while shooting The Five Doctors on location in Wales, producer John Nathan Turner and former Doctor John Pertwee spent some time convincing Troughton to attend the special 20th anniversary convention at Longleat, as Nathan Turner remembered. John Pertwee and I persuaded him to do it, and then he did, get, and then he did cartwheels to get out of it, and eventually he said, I'm not getting out of this, am I? And I said, no. It is important to note that Troughton and Pertwee were very fond of each other, as Pertwee was very keen to point out. We are tremendously fond of each other, but we made out we didn't get along at conventions because Pat's Doctor and mine didn't get on in The Three Doctors. So it was all an act, and a fine one too, causing all sorts of fun banter. As soon as Pertwee had taken over the TARDIS range in 1970, Troughton was already working hard on another major project, The Six Wives of Henry VIII, playing the role of Norfolk. This re-established him in the series character roles, although he will continue to enjoy other genre roles in horror and fantasy, such as Father Brennan, the tortured priest in The Omen in 1976. Billy Whitelaw was terrifying in the movie and proved that the most evil person was the one who looked normal. But Troughton didn't look that normal in the movie. He had to play a desperate priest, a man with terminal cancer who papered the walls of his home with pages of the Bible and was desperate to tell Peck and Remick the truth about their son Damien. His thick Irish accent, his deathly pale features, his inner frustration and desperation to be heard, his inner turmoil, make Troughton's role a truly memorable one in the film, 
and his death scene is one of the most iconic in horror movie history. Couple that with a haunting score by the legendary Jerry Goldsmith, and you have cinema history that is impossible to remake with, with any credit. After The Omen, Troughton took part in Sinbad and the Eye of the Tiger in 1977, one of Ray Harryhausen's last stop-motion movies. Troughton played the part of the wise man Melentheus. He had, of course, played the part of the blind man Phineas in Harryhausen's classic Jason and the Argonauts before Doctor Who, so he was not offered such parts because of his connection with the show. Indeed, he played alongside Christopher Lee in two Hammer Horrors classics, The Curse of Frankenstein in 1957 and Scars of Dracula in 1970, playing the small roles of Kurt and Clove, respectively. So the role of the Doctor had no ill effect on his career at all. Troughton could still take on small, interesting roles like any other job in act character actor. Troughton's love of popping in and out of familiar roles is clearly shown in his strong ties to two particular novels of Robert Louis Stevenson, Kidnapped and Treasure Island. Despite being in the classic Disney movie in 1950, Troughton returned to Treasure Island in 1977, where he played a very convincing Israel Hands in the TV series. His portrayal of the infamous swashbuckler Alan Breck in 1952 and 1956 in TV versions of Kidnapped were mentioned as career highlights by Troughton shortly before his death in the 1980s. There were some stories Troughton revisited throughout his career, Robin Hood being another one, and, of course, Doctor Who, which he returned to three times. Troughton enjoyed dabbling. He even dabbled in the soaps, taking a role in the longest running one of the lot, Coronation Street, playing the part of George Barton in 1974. So his character actor status was fully appreciated by all sorts of casting directors, not just those associated with action and fantasy. Troughton, who was an accomplished character actor and Doctor Who, did not tarnish that in any way. Despite severe heart attacks in 1978 and 1984, Troughton continued to work hard, taking on cameo roles in all creatures great and small, opposite future Doctor Who Peter Davison in an episode entitled Hair of the Dog. He was also the first person ever to be murdered in Inspector Morse in 1987. Troughton's last performance was in the TV comedy Supergun, also in 1987. Patrick Troughton died on 28th of March 1987 in Atlanta, USA. He was attending the Magnum Opus Con 2 in Columbus, Georgia. While taking part in the panel Q&A, he complained of feeling unwell and retired to his room. He suffered a fatal heart attack the following morning after ordering his breakfast and was found lying on the floor. He was pronounced dead on arrival at the hospital. He was 67. When people discuss Troughton's great roles, the part of the doctor is always there. But his Quilp and Breck, even so long ago, are also considered classic performances, as his portrayal of Cole Hawlings in the BBC, BBC Six Part Fantasy for Children, The Box of Delight. If we look at this role against that of Father Brennan in The Omen, and then his roles in Coronation Street and Doctor Who, Troughton's diversity and skill as a character actor is quickly showcased and appreciated. Patrick Troughton was the quintessential British character actor, never staying in one place or one role for too long. Perhaps Doctor Who fans were initially upset by this, especially the way he would talk about his other roles with equal or more love, but they soon come to understand why Troughton was sometimes shy of public appearances and interviews. He didn't want to give too much of himself away, or for them to get to know his true character. That said, he did return to Doctor Who several times, in 1973 for the Three Doctors, and in 1983 for the Five Doctors. And yet again, because he enjoyed the comeback so much, in 1985 for the Two Doctors. This last appearance, an excellent story featuring his faithful companion, Jamie, played by Fraser Hines, alongside then incumbents Colin Baker and Nicola Bryant, showcased Troughton's love for and humour in the role, through one dinner party scene at least, where he is momentarily transformed into a creature with a love of human flesh, with a counterpart chef from the same carnivorous race. All of these return visits show that Troughton had a place in his heart for the show right up until his untimely death. But let us not forget his other, now largely overlooked roles. Doctor Who was neither saint nor sinner to Patrick Troughton. What the Doctor has done for him is to keep him in the minds of the young forever, as the immortality of Doctor Who will keep his work alive and, perhaps, tempt some people into finding old Troughton gems on TV and DVD. Before moving on to the life and career of John Pertwee, I do wish to labour the fact that Patrick Troughton's life and career is dreadfully understated. Unfortunately, the biggest culprit of this was Troughton himself, not wishing to do too many interviews. But also it is the BBC's fault for erasing so many episodes of his Doctor Who, 
and also destroying or not recording so many of those early life TV series such as Robin Hood, Gunpowder Guy or Kidnapped. In many ways Patrick Troughton is the forgotten actor, let alone the lost doctor. One thing I have saved to mention here is of his fantastic performance as Adolf Hitler in the Gateway Theatre production of Eva Braun. This was in 1950 when feelings about the Nazis still ran high, but he did it and he did it well. Patrick Troughton isn't quite overlooked nowadays. He has a legacy through his family. His daughter's son is now Harry Potter's nemesis Dudley Dursley, Harry Melling. His son David Troughton, apart from being an accomplished Shakespearean actor, appeared in Doctor Who during his father's time in stories The Enemy of the World and The War Games, also playing a more substantial role as the dashing King Peladon opposite John Pertwee's Doctor in The Curse of the Peladon, and Professor Hobbs in David Tennant's uh, excellent story Midnight. David Troughton's brother Michael is an actor and teacher, most notable for playing opposite Rick Mayle in The New Statesman as Sir Pierce Fletcher Dervish. The Patrick Troughton Theatre opened at Mill Hill School in 2007 to celebrate one of its most accomplished former actor students and, along with his family and many Doctor Who fans around the world, Troughton's legacy is somewhat secured. That and, of course, the latest Doctor Who, Matt Smith, singling him out as a huge influence on his own interpretation of the Doctor. So there we have it, Patrick Troughton there, the second Doctor. I first saw uh, Troughton um, uh, in The Five Doctors. It was uh, The Five Doctors were probably one of the first Doctor, uh, Doctor Who episodes I actually ever saw when I was a youngster. Um, and I loved him right from the very start. I mean, I watched that when I was very young, you know, before 10, 10 years of age, uh, maybe 8 or 9. And, and straight away I fell in love with, with his character of, of the Doctor, you know, his portrayal, portrayal of the Doctor. I loved his humour, um, I loved how serious he could be, and I also loved his sort of physical performance as well. Um, and just the way he sort of interacted with the other characters, obviously as was mentioned in the book there, um, that kind of frosty tension between him and John Pertwee's Doctor. Um, you know the way he he uh, interacted with uh, Lethbridge Stewart, um, and just with, with all the other characters, how he was such a kind of um, graceful kind of doctor, um, a very gentle doctor. You know, especially with the ladies, and you know, like I say, from a very young age, you know, I, I really uh, I really got into his his doctor really. Uh, but as he sort of mentioned in that book there, it's such a shame because so many of, of his, along with, with William Hartnell's Doctor, so many of those episodes, um, you know, have not been seen by so many people, uh, myself included, you know, so many of them have been lost. Uh, I know quite a few of them have been found recently, but I think there's something like over a hundred uh, episodes that are still missing, uh, which is such a great shame because it, it limits the amount that, you know, I've been able to, to watch, um, you know, uh, Patrick Troughton's Doctor. Uh, so it wasn't really until a few years ago, really, that I got to see him, um, you know, during his spell as the Doctor. Um, and and again, you know, straight away, I I just really loved it and and loved his his uh, his portrayal um, of the Doctor. And, and most recently, the most recent one I saw was uh, Tomb of the Cybermen, uh, which was shown around the time of the fiftieth anniversary and. Uh, you know, when you look back at, at that era of, of Doctor Who, you know, there's so many kind of corny sort of storylines and it's all a bit cheesy, you know, there's a lot of overacting, you know, from some of the people um, that are in it, one companion in uh, uh, in particular. Uh, but but his uh, character and, and Jamie's relationship is just so spot on. Um, you know, it's, it's a typical um, sort of Doctor and companion relationship uh, and you, you can see how how well they, they really got on in real life as well um, but like I say you know along with with the with the cheesy scripts and the other acting of the other other actors you know he, he really just started stand out there as um, you know as the doctor you know sometimes for me from what I've seen in William Hartnell's um, episodes he kind of stood back a bit um, and you know the other characters kind of got involved but there was no doubt with, with Troughton's Doctor that he was the main man there uh, you know he was the one getting involved working out what was going on and everything um, 
and I just like I say his his humour, you know that that cosmic hobo uh, interpretation of it, and um, you know the slightly clownish performances that he gave was were just fantastic. And like I say, it was you know it was probably such a, a tough decision for him to go into a role that could have gone either way, you know, taking over from from someone like uh, William Hartnell or Billy Hartnell, as you like to call him, you know, that had gone down so well with with Doctor Who fans, you know, it was. It really could have gone so wrong, you know, going from from him into a, a, another role. Uh, but he did it perfectly, you know. Fantastic, fantastic casting from the guys, and fantastic acting from uh, from uh, Patrick Troughton. And I mean, away from Doctor Who, I mean the amount of, you know, films and big roles that he had there. You know, he, Patrick Troughton wasn't just you know Doctor Who. He was he was a fantastic actor, um, and like it says so many times, a fantastic character actor. Um, and you can see from the the few interviews that are there uh, out there on YouTube that he gave, he, he he never really gives gives himself away apart from uh, sort of one which was towards the end of his life. Uh, it is out there on YouTube if you if you want to uh, have a look. And and you can see he's a very gentle kind of guy. Um, you know, in a lot of um, interviews, especially sort of. Um, revolved around uh, the Doctor or with other actors of the Doctor um, you know he keeps sort of playing up and everything and uh, you know it's not kind of the real guy coming across uh, but there are some, some pretty you know nice interviews out there with uh, with Patrick Troughton and you know for me personally he's he really is up there as one of my favourite Doctors um, again as it says in the book he can sometimes be uh, be very understated uh, again, just because of the the loss of episodes and the lack of ones that people have seen, and sometimes a forgotten Doctor. But for me, I think he was fantastic and, and one of the top Doctors. And it's such a great testament to him that you know, obviously Matt Smith recently kind of based his Doctor on his, um, as it was just kind of mentioned at the end of the book. There, um, you know, Matt Smith has always said that it was his favourite um, his favourite Doctor, and you can see the similarities between the two. Sorry about this. Do excuse me for a moment. You've had this place redecorated, haven't you? Hmm. Don't like it. Oh, redecorated! I don't like it. Um, you know, the kind of clowning about, the body movements, the use of the hands especially. Um, so you can see that, you know, in, a, in a, the younger generation and, and the new generation of Doctor Who, the fact that Patrick Troughton is clearly still there and still there in the character of the Doctor. Um, and that's really really great to see and really brilliant to see so so there we have it guys that's uh, that's Patrick Troughton there uh, the second Doctor a fantastic Doctor in my opinion but I want to know your thoughts um, those of you um, you know probably of the older generation what your thoughts were on Patrick Troughton um, and those that have never really seen much of him before and this is maybe the first that you've they've really heard of him uh, give your uh, thoughts and impressions, and just go out there and try find some uh, some clips of him. Um, but like I say there's plenty out there on YouTube, whether it's in uh, Doctor Who or in his film roles. In Jason, I mean Jason in the Argonauts. Funnily enough, was only on yesterday, um, so I, uh, I I just flicked that on to to have a look at him in that. And again, fantastic acting from the guy. Uh, so yeah, let me know your thoughts, guys. And once again, uh, let me know if you want me to uh, to do the competition to uh, to win a copy of the book, the Doctor Who's Who, the one that I'm reading from. Um, you know, there's bits in this that I am missing out. So you know, by, by getting the book, you know, I'm not giving it all away on here. There are other bits in there that I won't be reading out. So it's uh, it's a great book. So do let me know if you want me to do that competition, guys. And if I get enough interest, then I'll do that later in the series. So. As always guys, thank you very much for watching. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below or at my Twitter, Chris Jones LUFC. Uh, thank you for watching and I will see you next time where we'll be looking at the career and life of John Pertwee, the Third Doctor. Thank you very much.